This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback, and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Be sure to check out my weekly podcast, You're Welcome with Michael Malice, now on Podcast One. You might know me from my terrible Twitter, my horrible books, or the nonsense I spout on podcasts like Rogan and Glenn Beck. It's all there. Are you black-pilled or white-pilled for the future of the UK? What is a man? <laughs> what is a man? What is a no? I, what is the, I, are you white pilled or black pilled? No seriousness, girl. No, 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 I love the Jesse Lee piece of question. <laughs> the fact that you discovered that gives me hope for some of the things that I've still got well, that are missing. Well, if you need James G. Blaine's autograph, you are welcome to it. Of course, being the co author of How to Have Impossible Conversations makes you the perfect guest for this train wreck of a show. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> new episodes are available every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and wherever you get your podcasts. You are welcome. This week on the podcast, very excited to sit down and chat with Louise Perry. She's a columnist at the New Statesman, a features writer for the Daily Mail, and the press officer for the campaign group We Can't Consent to This. Her debut book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century, was published in 2022 to critical acclaim, universally described as challenging and provocative, and hailed by The Observer as possibly one of the most important feminist books of its time. I really loved talking to Louise. She is so insightful. This book is so important. And as I mentioned in this podcast, I'm kind of a case study for exactly the phenomenon that she's laying out. So enjoy. All right. I'm with Louise Perry. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. Hello. Very pleased to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Your book is making quite the splash, the case against the sexual revolution. How has the response to it been so far? So it's not actually out in the States yet. It's been out in the UK for like six weeks. Okay. We've got maybe a month until it comes out in America. Mm -hmm. And the response is kind of a kind of overwhelming and amazing and really positive. Good. Because I sort of I wrote it knowing it was a it was a controversial book and knowing that I'd kind of get flamed and I have a bit, you know, I've got sort of criticism from every angle you could imagine, but I'd say that like 90% of the response has been really positive. Why did you write this book? I'd sort of been writing it. It's a culmination of a lot of thinking, a lot of work over a long time. Cause I've, I've spent my whole professional life in this area in sort of different ways so when I I did women's studies at university and then when I left I worked in a rape crisis center which was like whiplash inducing let me tell you to mm. go from like academic feminism to um <laughs> line services I bet. and yeah and then I and then I became a journalist and I and I written a lot about sex and relationships and tech and crime and sort of everything that feeds into this book and I also work for a campaign group which is I write about in the book, which is about the um, increasingly common use of so-called rough sex Mm defence in murder cases in the UK and elsewhere too. It's a problem in the States as well. So in a way, this is like a conglomeration of everything. It's like a 10-year writing project, although I did actually write it in about a year, a bit less than that. And of all of the criticisms that you've received from people, what do you think are the ones that are maybe the most fair? Which is yeah, that's a good question. So that so the different angles of criticism. One is from because I should start by saying there are a lot of different strands within this book. It's right. sort of it's sort of there's something in it for everyone to hate because I'm kind of taking bits from different like opposing groups and also like disagreeing with everyone at the same time. So for instance, I've got I'm really interested in evolutionary psychology. I'm starting from the premise that I think that like psychological differences between men and women are largely innate. Mm -hmm. 
so that's been very annoying for radical feminists, <laughs> <laughs> including friends, you know, friends of mine who really, really, really don't like that because mm-hmm. to their mind, it's it's almost like giving up. It's saying, mm-hmm. well, then we're never going to actually have proper, we're never going to eradicate sexual violence. We're never going to have actual equality between sexes if you think that it's that ingrained. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so they'd accuse me of sort of being defeatist. Okay. The other criticism I get is from sex positive feminists or sort of sex positive people generally who think that I'm a massive Debbie Downer <laughs> about things like BDSM, which I'm really critical of. And 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 basically I mean the whole book really is 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 like a critique of that view. The the view is that what matters is individual autonomy as long as people are consenting as long as people are, have the freedom to make their own decisions in relation to their sexual lives then that's what matters mm-hmm. and it's not my place it's not anyone's place to be telling people what they should and shouldn't do in the bedroom as long as everyone involved is consenting as long as you you sort of reach that legal threshold mm-hmm. for consent then everything's fine so that's one school of criticism and the thing is, like, I am willing to accommodate the fact that there are obviously all loads of outliers. There always are. If you're ta- if you're writing a book, if you're talking about something as massive as like relationships between men and women over the last fifty years or longer, of course there are going to be people who've had really unusual experiences, who really genuinely love consensual BDSM and polyamory and all the stuff that I'm critical of. Of course, there will be people like that. I'm necessarily generalizing because if I wasn't generalizing, I couldn't say anything. Right. But also what I'm arguing is that that's not the norm. Right. It's And I think you can say that simultaneously, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's I, I'm impressed with this book because I've been trying to write a piece for probably four years now about how I regret being a slut and now I'm finishing it because of your book. But Amazing. it's be but it's been a hard needle to thread because mm-hmm. I'm not sure how to I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And many, you know, the early feminist, I think, first wave revolution is necessary and important. And mm-hmm. then you get to the sexual revolution. And I think the pill has liberated women in ways that allow them to go to work and have more control over something they had absolutely no control over. But the side effect of this has mm-hmm. been to unyoke sex from the consequences and ultimately, I feel like there's had to be some kind of massive justification for it. I don't really understand it, but it, when I read your book, I've been doing this bit, The Patriarchy So Crafty, mostly around kind of trans activism, where it's like, the patriarchy so crafty, they'll convince women to like sign their own losses in sports mm-hmm. or whatever. And Mm. This book, too, there are parts where I'm like, how did (laughs) women get tricked (laughs) into this? Yeah. Like, how did women get tricked into? Ultimately, this is better for men and, and, you know, Mm. having open women having sex like men. And the piece I've been trying to write is and why I started crying when I read your dedication to your book, which is to the women who I might cry right now to the women who learn the hard way, I learn the hard way. Like I'm, mm. I'm one of these women. And I don't think it's just Gen Z that's actually felt the effects of this, you say, kind of the most, because they're actually not having as much sex. They, they're mm. already reacting to it. I actually think mm. like Gen X and millennial women have With suffered. The hard mark. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Because we, I'm Gen X, and really kind of on the border of the millennial. And Mm -hmm. I think that we fully imbibed that lie. I mean, I did. I fully embodied the lie that having sex like a man is empowering. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I've, it took me years and I had to get sober. And I mean, so many things to shake that lie off. But I think what happens is it's an, in a lot of ways, it was like getting sober and you have to deal with the shame of all of the stuff that you did under the guise of that lie. And it's not, I, I mean, it would have been easier for me to just keep being like, rah, rah. Mm. 
Mm. And I think that's why this book is so necessary, but I also can see why it would be hard for people to face that in themselves. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're like my age and you've made a lot of choices under this this kind of idea, this lie that you've been told. And that's what was made me curious is, was there a moment where you saw, you know, your friends or people suffering and felt like I need to just write this book, even if it's wildly unpopular? Or There wasn't like a single moment where I thought this really has to be said. I mean, I did, I used to be a liberal feminist. I never like, I was never like properly guzzling the cool way. <laughs> I, like I always thought, I was always, for instance, a bit like prostitution isn't that great, really. Like I never, I never fully bought into sex workers' work or yeah, no. whatever. But I definitely thought that, well, you know, porn is all right if people are consenting, whatever. So I, I, I kind of went with the flow generally mm -hmm. until I was maybe sort of early twenties. Mm. I'm thirty now, so that's almost a decade ago. And yeah, I mean, it is. I cannot help but notice of the women that I know personally and have you know, like spoken to professionally and so on, that very, very, very often the women who buy into it are the hardest, the, that have sex like a man thing, it's coming from some sort of place of trauma. Yeah, for me, it definitely was. And yeah. that, that's what this piece was about. Like sex is, sex is not empowering if you're coming from a place of trauma. It's, it's actually going to set you back and do more harm than good because you're just layering more and more on top of this trauma. And almost yeah. always it seems like that's, I mean, there was also a part of me that weaponized sexuality. So coming out of it being traumatic, I was like classic, as, in, as you mentioned in your book, at age 17, drugged and raped when I was out drinking with a bunch of people who were older than me. And then after that, and I kind of leaned into being hyper promiscuous, which is a mm -hmm. natural response to this. I didn't yeah, tell anyone. Common, yeah. And yeah. I think then I just had to build a like psychological defense around it. And so mm -hmm. it, it turned into just weaponizing sexuality. And I, I wanted to become this kind of man eater. You know, that was mm -hmm. really what I told myself for years was like, I can do this. And, and your book points to, I mean, going your book, it, I was laughing that your book didn't have a trigger alert, but it really is quite <laughs> triggering for somebody who yeah. learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, 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 it really is. This is like a tough read. Yeah, I did actually think, you know, at one point that maybe I should do something like say, I don't know, chapters, like two through five are really tough or something. Yeah. I because mean, it's it, they're kind to, of all tough, though. They're all tough to me. To, yeah. to me, the the dedication was enough of a trigger warning. <laughs> Page one, <laughs> and it was like to all for the women who learned it the hard way. I was like, oh, this isn't going to be a fun read. <laughs> and let's talk about your your table of contents because I did. I that went viral, right? Like yeah, before yeah, the, the book even came out. Published, yeah. So I'll yeah. just read them quickly. Well, you had a foreword by Kathleen Stock, which was great. Mm -hmm. And then sex must be taken seriously. Men and women are different. Some desires are bad. Loveless sex is not empowering. Consent is not enough. Violence is not love. People are not products. Marriage is good. And the conclusion, mm -hmm. listen to your mother. Yeah. So let's go through that. Let's talk about sex must be taken seriously. So... The idea behind all these chapter titles, right, is that from one angle they're incredibly obvious, right. and from another angle they're incredibly <laughs> controversial. Which right. is why, which is why I had such a big impact on Twitter because it was pe some people being like "duh" and other people thinking I was like fascist adjacent for saying this stuff. <laughs> I mean, my claim in that the sex must be taken seriously claim is is a reaction against an idea that I call sexual disenchantment, which comes comes out of the sexual revolution. And it's this idea that that sex used to be considered in the bad old days, in the 1950s, you know, the 1950s, right? This is the classic phrase of the bad old days, to be sacred, to have a sort of special status, to have certain rules surrounding it that didn't apply to other kinds of social interaction or whatever. And the sexual disenchantment idea says, no, sex is, you know, can be good, can be bad. It's morally neutral. If people want to invest it with meaning, then they can. 
but they don't have to. It mm-hmm. can just be as meaningless as shaking someone's hand or making coffee or, you know, like whatever neutral activity you want to come up with. And this idea is portrayed as being liberating in the sense that it's supposed to free us from the bad old days when sex was suffused with with shame. Mm. The problem, I think, with the, with the idea is, I mean, one, I don't think anyone actually believes it. I don't think anyone actually lives as if sexual disenchantment was true. Almost no one does. Everyone has whether or not they want to like we all have instinctive visceral responses to sex that we don't have to other things like we care if our partners cheat on us Mm -hmm. we don't care if our partners shake someone else's hand right Mm -hmm. we do care if someone (laughs) does our partners cheat on us like and it's really really hard to undo that even if you try really hard as polyamorous often Mm -hmm. do right Mm -hmm. basically no one really lives as if sexual disenchantment was true and also i think it actually it's wrong to try because if you if you really want to say that sex is no different from shaking someone's hand and shouldn't have any kind of special status, you also can't say that rape has a special status. Right. You also can't say that sexual harassment has a special status or like revenge porn has a special status or all this stuff, which we know ruins people's lives mm-hmm. and clearly is worse than the sort of non-sexual counterpart theft or like copyright violation or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to come up Mm -hmm. with, right? It's clearly different. And I think that trying to claim that it isn't really doesn't serve women's interests in particular. I don't think it serves anyone's interests, but really not women's. You opened this book and it was interesting again for me, who's like the case study of this book. (laughs) I, I wrote for Playboy for years. So you opened talking about just Playboy and Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe. And when I was writing for Playboy, I loved that job. I did mostly columns. They're all kind of scrubbed now, which is unfortunate. I learned a lot about men. And I I would, I think you make this point in the book. And I would also argue that I don't think the sexual revolution, even though it is better for men, has been great Mm -hmm. for men either for many different ways. And that was surprising to me hearing from thousands of men just kind of how disillusioned they were with feeling kind of purposeless and also Mm -hmm. just wanting something more meaningful as well and not really being able to find it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of where I thought I was on the spectrum of kink to what exists I was like oh I'm vanilla (laughs) I'm like (laughs) like I thought I was kinky and then I started writing for Playboy and like all of a sudden reporting on all these different things I had never even heard of I I was just I felt like a a virgin all over again in so many ways (laughs) and it is interesting you know you talk about how and it's something I for some reason hadn't really considered just how everybody you know, kind of lifts Hugh up and is like, oh, he was so pro women's rights and he always fought for the pill and fought for abortion. And you're like, yeah, of course, mm. of course he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't out of the goodness of his heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm really interested to go home and talk to, I was just texting with my aunt, like all my aunts who came of age around the 70s. You know, they were mm-hmm. all young women at that point. Mm. And what their perspective is on the sexual revolution now that they're older and have children and they're approaching 60s, 70s. Mm. I'm definitely, because they lived through that, you know, and I I wonder, because Mm. they also have the perspective on what it was like for their mothers, these 1950s housewives that I can, for some, it's, it's almost like a it's not a true perspective, you know, it's, it's something Mm. I've kind of gathered from television and from anecdotes, but it's not, they lived, they lived under that. Their Mm. mothers kind of being these, having real no options and they got to go to work. They were the first generation that was really out there kind of working, I think really in droves. And Mm. I'm, One of the things that you say in chapter two that's controversial now, and I don't know why, and this is one of the reasons I got kind of booted from Playboy, is men and women are different, which I thought was an okay statement to make when I was working at Playboy, but it's this is a statement that's beyond the pale. At Playboy, 
Oh, I mean, I was not. <laughs> I mean, I know everywhere else, but <laughs> I was not. Well, I, they basically were saying that I was like the biggest bro working at Playboy because I, <laughs> I stumbled out. I didn't go to college, so I did. I wasn't. You know, I didn't come up learning feminist studies. I dropped out early when I was nineteen. I was always kind of hustling. I was waiting tables and always wanting to be a writer. And then I got this job at Playboy in 2015 and basically stumbled into, you know, the culture war coming kind of out of a decade long blackout. And I had no, Mm. I didn't realize how much things had changed in terms of, I came from kind of the 90s Maxim, you know, magazine where it was it was still very just like bro culture and mm-hmm. then it, it changed a lot and and women and gay men pretty much took over all of the magazines even the male magazines and they didn't they didn't really like my kind of old school vibe <laughs> 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 I mean I wrote a piece that was um women date assholes because you're a pussy and that was like one of the first articles that I wrote for for Playboy. And I didn't know that I would get so piled on by women. I thought that I was saying I thought that I was like, hey, see, like I'm saying something that's kind of true. And I got piled on by and you mentioned this, these two kind of the the curve, the men's right activists came for me and the radical feminists came for me and feminists or liberal feminists, yeah. I guess. Can you explain how people are reacting to men and women are different and what you mean by that in this chapter? So I mean it where there are two levels of meaning. One of they're both controversial, but one more than the other. So one is just that like on a physical level, men and women are different. That I'm guessing when you started a Playboy, that was that was was that the year that Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time? So that yes. was like the big trans year. Yeah, it was twenty fifteen. Yeah, things have really started changing, like you say, 2013 with the Me Too yeah. stuff ramping up. Yeah, and so yeah. I went, I got there and then they went to No Nude. Remember when Playboy did that for a minute? Yeah. So I mm. literally got a job there and then they were, I did stand up about how I was like, I'm not going to say it was my fault, but <laughs> um, then, and then they went back to it. And yeah, it was a very, strange time being a playboy and I really like you I'm fascinated with sex because it's so all-encompassing of the human experience it is everything it's yeah it's love and violence and reproduction and intimacy and vulnerability and it's it is everything and to act like it's not is a lie yeah. And yeah. also to act like men and women don't have different stakes is I that just seems so obvious to me. I think not yeah. going to college did me a big service. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I think that actually you really like the, the university feminism like forces you to unlearn obvious things right <laughs> like you can only believe crazy stuff by being, <laughs> by being inculcated at university yeah, yeah obviously men and women, everyone knows that men and women well no not i everyone. think everyone knows deep down i i well I, I don't know i mean sometimes you do get some really outrageous statements from feminists primarily about like oh i'm like the only reason that women aren't as good at men in the olympics is because we're like socialized to yeah like, come on. How can like anyone who's stepped foot in a gym knows that that's not true? I don't understand, though, how this has gone so mainstream because mm. it's like my friend said, he was like, I can sit down and have a conversation with you. <laughs> if we have a differing opinion about, you know, whatever, corporal punishment or abortion, even. But if you're going to mm. sit there and look me in the face and say that men and women should compete equally in sports. I can't even, how am I supposed to take you seriously? And that somehow has become a mainstream mantra that Mm. if you don't repeat, you'll get, you know, you have the chance of getting booted from social media and there are real Mm. life repercussions for not repeating this. It's It's mad, isn't it? It's madness. I I assume that, I mean, I think the people who, 
sort of believe it. They must be very indoorsy. I don't think they really do any like. You made that <laughs> point in here actually, and I was yeah. I wrote LOL when you were like, I don't think that people are. What did you say? They're not working manual labor, which is really no, definitely because I've not. worked a lot of manual labor, and I and so yeah, there were certain things on the farm that the women couldn't do when we worked on yeah. the farm. Yeah. And the men had to do. And you said they were indoors and there was one other thing in that that was hilarious. What was the third yeah, thing? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I have to find it. It was so funny. <laughs> but go on about what are the two parts of how men and women are different other than the obvious yeah, so this, physical. This is the, the physical component, which is like newly controversial, but only controversial within the last like five years and among, oh, among us. manual job elite. competed sports or bear children that was the third yeah, one yeah 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 no completely yeah I, I mean we've both had the experience of having babies right in the in the last year yeah and I don't think anything will like upend your faith in the blank slate <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. having a baby <laughs> but the whole just the hormones alone like it's insane the effect that it has on your mind yeah as well as on your body. Yeah. I learned I learned recently, you know, the compulsion to check your baby's uh, breathing. Yeah, I just wrote about this. <laughs> I still I'm still doing it. Yeah. I do, you do it less. You do like wind down. So yeah. our, our son's 15 months now, but I still check his breathing like I know times a night. women who have teenage boys and girls who just still check their kids' breathing. <laughs> they- so did you know that chimpanzee and bonobo mums do that too? Wow. Yeah. I believe that. So you think, and I think it's actually really good to know that because I know I felt like when I was checking his breathing all the time, I was like, oh my God, am I going crazy? <laughs> is this is this pe- like some sort of postpartum Madness. You know, mental illness? No, it's good. No. It's instinct. It's fine. It's like like your the whole event just takes over your mind and your body and you just have to kind of go with it. There was something I was reading recently that they've done all these studies about mom brain now. They have finally started mm. studying this and it is a real thing and you actually mm. lose gray matter and it's because <laughs> they, that, they yeah. think that it's because it's actually being repurposed to be hyper focused on the baby. So yeah. you have a like an inability to kind of connect to other people or care about what they're saying or anything, but it's just being so you can hyper focus on connecting to your all that resource goes to connecting to your baby. Just fascinating. I mean, your brain yeah. literally changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's and it's completely outside of your control. I mean, things like that thing where you wake up in the night and you're instantly like, "Where's the baby?" Uh huh. Or if you're if you're co sleeping and you end up like apparently all women mums as long as you're not like really drunk or high or whatever like that you're so attuned to your baby that when you're in bed you'll you'll form like a protective c-shape around the baby as an instinct and you're unconscious like this is it it, it's not like you're deciding to do any of this it's just like we're animals and well and we went thousands of years without bassinets and swaddles Mm. and all these things so it's not it's not like it's not ingrained in us and you make this point in your book too that I love about how really much closer we are the the world that liberal feminists have constructed socially is is much further away than we are to even our like hunter and gatherer ancestor Completely. roots. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very fragile. Mm-hmm. It's built on technology really. Yep. It's built on a I mean the pill is the is like the really obvious example but all sorts of things that, that give us this impression of gender neutrality. Mm-hmm. But actually, you know, if we suddenly lost all this technology tomorrow, I can tell you we would have a much less like gender egalitarian I setup. always say this. We I'm would like, instantly go back. Yeah, I'm like, if this shit hit the fan, it'd be pretty clear who, <laughs> what the roles are. <laughs> like, if there was yeah. a massive earthquake in Los Angeles right now, it's not going to be the women out there lifting people out from the rubble. It's they're going to yeah. be helping at home and taking care of the kids and gathering resources while the men go try and help out. Yeah. It's just yeah, yeah. Division of labor just makes sense. And it happens pretty quickly. You know, you don't see this mm-hmm. like during uh, there was the hurricane in Houston a few years ago and there were all these images of men carrying women through the floods and helping. And then, of course, all the conservatives were like, yeah, toxic masculinity. Am I right? But <laughs> there's they're like, suddenly it's not toxic when there's an emergency. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. This stuff is like it's evolved for a reason. Mm-hmm. And masculinity has like light and shade. And so does femininity. There's toxic femininity as well. Mm-hmm. And um 
I, th- the, the, I mean, so the, the point I'm making in Men and Women in a different chapter, which is a controversial one, is that obviously there are outliers, obviously this is an average thing, but there are really profound psychological differences between men and women in all sorts of ways. And there is more and more evidence every day for the existence of these. And you can't just attribute it to childhood socialization. I mean, clearly there is a bit of that. Our life experiences obviously affect us in all sorts of ways, but you see these differences across cultures, really different cultures. You know, you'll still have differences in in traits like agreeableness and neuroticism and violence like that's mm-hmm. one of the biggest ones men are so much more physically aggressive than women Anyone and in terms, of, and in terms and of sexuality knows, knows this i know my son he i mean he's only 15 months but like i keep trying to give him dolls and like, anthropomorphic cuddly toys and he's just like no give me a wheel yeah no i mean they've done <laughs> give me a hinge have you <laughs> he just seen... loves mechanisms yeah <laughs> have you yeah. seen um becoming you on apple tv no. It's so good. Lenore Skenazy, who is kind of the woman behind the free range child movement in America, mm-hmm. she came on the podcast and I was pregnant. And we were talking about all, all of this stuff, raising children to be self confident and to have unstructured play. And mm-hmm. she was mentioning to watch Becoming You. And it's this amazing documentary that follows a hundred kids all over the world. And Mm. in different cultures through the first most formative five years of their life. And there's this one that's broken up into different segments, you know, based on around development. And one segment was about these kids and they're very gender fluid. But then at a certain age, I think it's three, they all just sort. And this is true kind Mm. of all across the globe. There'll be... He was wearing costumes, this little kid, and he was like, I want a crown and I want to, I'm going to be a princess today. And then at three, it just, they all sort. And suddenly he wants to be Superman and the girls start playing together and the boys start playing together and the boys play much rougher. And this is pretty true, just all across the board with children everywhere. And for some reason, like my husband said, he's like, yeah, and some some of the extreme liberals would want to trans that kid before yeah. three. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. Is Which is actually so much more like oppressive and terrible, right? <laughs> yeah. Than say, because often what people hear when you say, even really smart people can be weirdly bad at understanding averages. Mm-hmm. And when, what they hear sometimes when you say like, you know, women are women are more anxious than men are on average or whatever. They'll say, but I know this woman who's really not anxious and I know this man who's really anxious. Or like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. This is the whole idea with averages. And and, and ditto with kids. There are clearly kids who have, have very gender non-conforming interests. Mm-hmm. And people point out things like pink has not always historically been a girly colour, which is true. I mean, what, what girls are doing when they get obsessed with pink is it's not the colour itself. It's the girliness that they're, they're like drawn to identifying with their group yeah and demonstrating it in all sorts of ways right and the, and their group just happens to have been assigned the color pink so that's why they're really into it mm-hmm. um but how much worse to say like instead of saying look these averages exist you know we're not all like crazy for recognizing the fact that girls and boys tend to sort of flock to different things generally but there are some kids for whom that's not true right you can sterilize those kids <laughs> right. just because they don't like fit with the stereotype. Right. And and yet that's progressive. Yeah, it's strange. It's it, yeah. I don't know if that's just the natural like you mentioned in this book is it the na- is this the natural I kept laughing because you know that meme like real communism hasn't been tried. Yeah, I kept yeah, thinking yeah. in your book it's like real feminism hasn't been tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, real sexual revolution hasn't been tried. Yeah. That, is, that has been one of the responses that I've had is like, oh, it's just because we haven't done it properly. We just have to like, we just have to be more free. And what exactly? And like we've been doing this for 60 years. Yeah. And what what does that, what does that look like for people mm. to be more free than we already are? That's a, that's a mm. topic that really I have to sit with and think about a lot is the what you talk about, you know, freedom has a cost essentially, and it's a, there are yeah. trade offs for it. What are some of the trade offs for women for freedom, for their freedom? I mean, other than everything you mentioned in your book. 
I mean, so one example, going back to the motherhood thing, right, is is that now we've we've got the option now to go to work. For I mean, it's always been the case that poor women have have had to go to work, but up until relatively recently, middle and upper class women would not would not work. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be considered shameful generally because it would be seeming to suggest that their husbands couldn't bring home the bacon. But we have this influx of women into the workforce from the 60s and 70s onwards, and now you have very high labour force participation, even for mums of little kids. And, like, great. I, uh, you know, like, we're both, like, at work right now. <laughs> this is... But it's like, hard. I, I, have, I have personally really benefited from it in all sorts of ways. Right. But the, the, the cost is that now it's the expectation that you have to go to work. Mm you see things like property prices are much higher than they used to be because now you need two incomes Mm -hmm. to be paying for this stuff because there hasn't been a lot of house building and the amount of property is 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 a fixed in quantity so obviously there's that like people are going to be competing and they're competing now with the woman's income as well as the man's yeah like the this is the sort of example of like yeah i guess we're now free to go to work but there are costs down the line, particularly <laughs> I, to mums, because because it's so hard as we as we as we found out. Like it is, like just things like breastfeeding. Like when I was breastfeeding in the first few months of my son's life, I was literally doing it for forty hours. Yeah, a week. it's I was a full time full-time job. Time job. It yeah. is, and I, I couldn't do another forty hour week. No, and so you, you'd have to choose. There's so much here. My gosh, I could talk to you for like Rogan length podcast because the <laughs> there's. I've been joking kind of nonstop and we do a little check in at the end of my podcast, my cousin and I. And one of the recent ones, I was like, feminism was a mistake. <laughs> and it's been my, my ongoing joke since I had Matilda because she I feel like I'm failing at both. I don't feel like I can give work my everything. And I mm-hmm. feel like she needs me particularly now and I again yeah. am in a, a very luxurious position of being able to work from home and yep. so I can make my own schedule and my husband is here often and he has a more flexible so we're in mm. uh, but I also don't have nannies and all this stuff either mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't want to like outsource all of that stuff and I I really can't afford to either that's kind of a luxury and it's been eye-opening, you know, for me, mm. just as, because I look at people who have to, like you said, go back to work. I was like, I know I'm middle class because I'm working at six weeks. <laughs> but I look at women who have to go back to a physical place and they're breastfeeding. Yeah, still and they're bleeding. six weeks out? Six yeah. weeks. Yeah, still bleeding. Yeah. And, yeah. and not in your right mind at all. And yeah. that's, I feel like particularly in America, I don't know that this is true in all of Europe, but it feels like they got to just kind of double the workforce and yeah. nobody really got any <laughs> benefits from it. Yeah, it's like this unholy alliance between libertarians and feminists. Mm. No, maybe libertarians is unfair. I mean, between like free marketeers, mm-hmm. it's been great for GDP. <laughs> right, Getting women into the workforce would be fabulous. And, like, and and in all seriousness, I'm sure this is true in the states as well. Like the treasury in the UK, they don't want women staying at home more. I mean, we have a more generous maternity allowance, so it's a, a lot of women will take a year of maternity leave. Oh here. wow, that's amazing. Um, they don't really get paid for it. I mean, it's complicated. Like there are some cushy jobs where you'll get long periods of fully paid leave. That's not really the norm. Mm-hmm. You, you like you take a bit of a financial hit, but you do have the right if you're employed to go back to your job after a year and it will still be there for you, mm-hmm. which is not true for most women in America. So, no. that you know, it's clearly really good. But a year is also, like, a, a one-year-old is really young. Yeah. Like, you can put a one-year-old in, in daycare. You can put a, you know, three-month-old three month old or whatever mm-hmm. in daycare for 60 hours a week and head back to the office. And, like, you can physically do it, but it's going to really hurt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt the baby. Mm-hmm. And, and the tra- you know... But that's clearly in the interest of tax revenue. But in in UK, policy is all geared towards getting women back as quickly as possible to work. Wow. And this is being presented as being feminist and empowering women. Mm-hmm. And like, I guess that's kind of true. I mean, there's clearly it is clearly the case that having your own income gives you like women in abusive relationships is clearly incredibly important for them to have financial potential financial right. independence. You know, like I, I I take all of that, 
I like my job. <laughs> like I don't. Yeah. But also equally, is this free? Yeah. Is, this free, is freedom the right word for what we're experiencing here? It's funny. When I was in high school, I, I had a very, you know, we all, we all learn our feminism somewhere. And I had a very feminist English teacher. And she was where mm. I was first exposed to it. And I she was like, you're going to set women back, you know, hundreds of years or whatever. Because I was like, what's wrong with being in the kitchen? I don't want to be in the rat race. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't see the upside, really. And as I as I've gotten older and been there have been moments where I've been dependent on men and because I've been kind of hustling on my own for so long that's actually the rarity in my life is and I get so much anxiety from it so Mm. my cousin and I were talking about this she's like I like being able to provide for myself I like not having to depend on a husband or a man to pay for me and know that I can do that and that is hugely beneficial but like you said, there's there's a trade off there. And yeah, I'm not sure. Like in this book, I think the thing that was heartbreaking to me was I got lucky. I got sober. I met my husband. I'm 43 and had a baby. They told me I was in menopause. It was like a, she's like a freak accident, a not possible miracle mm. child. And naturally got pregnant after they told me I couldn't and we had kind of surrendered we were like oh we're not going to go through like IVF and everything we're older we're late bloomers well and then she just appeared and um I get emotional and I think of I think of so many women who won't have that option Mm. because they're we do have a clock that ticks and people think that it's they can be you know I'm like, don't wait until you're 43 because people are like, I'm going to be like you. I'm like, don't use me. And they told me I couldn't have kids and that I was in menopause. Like your your stuff starts going off the cliff like around 35 years old. You know, it's it's still possible, obviously, and it's it, it can cost a lot of money. But it's not always possible at, at mm-hmm. even 35, 36, 37 years old. It gets so much harder. And mm-hmm. that's really where... I'm having to look at how much I projected. It's been so much, so many lies, Louise, so many. So many that I told myself through my 20s, through my 30s, and then the lies I told myself about motherhood, that I mm-hmm. didn't want kids. I was, I mean, that's a whole, that one's, that one's, that one's even more painful than looking at the in kind of internalized slut shaming. I don't even know what it is. That that one's harder to look at for for me. And then having a daughter, it's even more confusing. Mm. I like what mm. you said at the end where you're you're kind of laying out what you would tell your daughter or your child if you had one. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. I know that every day someone tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen with The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest. Recently, he sat down with Sebastian Younger, and they talked about how people get addicted to war and recall times of crisis with fondness. Sebastian is a journalist, filmmaker, and best-selling author of The Perfect Storm, A True Story, of Men Against the Sea is probably how you know him, but he's also discussing his new book, Tribe, on homecoming and belonging and what he's learned by covering war for the past 20 years. He's also had John Abramson on a very important episode about how Big Pharma broke American health care. If you are like me and don't understand anything about why the health care system is so broken, this is a great place to start. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our next partner has a product my husband and now cousin Maggie use literally every day. They both started taking AG1 because they felt like they weren't getting all their vitamins and didn't want to take all these supplements and pills and vitamins and frankly wanted to see what all the hype was about. Once Jaron got started on it, Maggie saw how amazing it was for him and she got started on it and now she's a huge believer in it and loves it. 
She likes that she can know she's getting all of her vitamins first thing in the morning. It's become a routine for both of them. And it's also very reasonable. If you're paying for all of these supplements and vitamins, it can really add up. With AG1, it costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash W-I-W. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash W-I-W to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I wanted to go back to the chapters. Some desires are bad because this is another chapter that is hard to read. <laughs> but talk, talk to us about what that that looks like. That one sent the sent twist of bananas. Of Did it? Of, of Why? All, yeah, of all of my... When the chapter titles got shared, even before publication, people were like, are you trying to are you trying to shame people for their mm. desires? You know, the war on shame. Kink shaming. But, yeah. I mean, that chapter is mostly about pedophilia. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right? Like, because it's, it is just clearly the case that actually a lot of, a lot of sexual desire, but a lot of desire in general is dark and destructive and, and, and like radically antisocial. And I think to see us as just being these kind of benign beings that need to be set free to like fulfill our our desires is just clearly unworkable when so many desires are when when they come into conflict so often. Mm-hmm. To wh- to which you know sexual liberals will say, well, that's fine because that's what the consent framework is for. So if you say, well, you know, your your desire might be to I don't know to go out into the park and masturbate in front of people, but if they're not consenting, then you can't. Sorry, right. you know, you, you come up against the consent buffers. But the problem is, and I think this is this is this is the whole crux of it, that our insight isn't necessarily very good as human beings. Right. No. We don't always we don't always know what we really want. We don't always know what's good no, for us. I am a case study of this. Think, yeah. You can just parade think... me around and use me and be like, here's a perfect example of this, the person I'm talking about in this book. Because it's like, that's the piece I've been trying to write is the lies, the lies that mm. I had to tell myself to keep believing this. And it was so, it's so socially acceptable and not only acceptable, mm. it's, it's, it's really just kind of like the way, you know, you have mm. to fall in it's line. It's the path of least resistance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I I find it. I was just thinking the other day about writing a column about how memes are so much more like profound and true and beautiful than pretty much anything you'll see in a modern art museum. Because, it, like, I think it really is our like it is a much better art form than most things that you will see elsewhere. Yeah, because it's like the internet hive mind like yeah. dragging up. Because the whole idea of the meme is that you look at it and you're like, yes, yeah, it's supposed to have that really instinctive appeal. And that's also true of a lot of slang yeah. that's come from the internet. There's also like, it's really funny how much slang has come from incels, even though everyone despises incels. We've we've talked a lot but, about the meme being yeah. like we. I'm having a conversation with this author Thomas de Zangotita. And he's the author of this book, Mediated, and it's brilliant. Like he wrote it in 2005 and it was light years ahead of its time. And so Mm. we're going through it chapter by chapter, which actually is something that I should have done with you where I go through this book (laughs) chapter. Maybe, maybe we will. Um, We go through chapter by chapter and just talk about the, the, that chapter specifically. And we were talking about memes because he has this whole concept of the blob, which is just the mediated process that absorbs ev- everything. And I'm like, memes are the digestive enzyme of this blob. It's how right. we're, it's like a massive, brilliant coping mechanism for the minute something, it can, it can be the most traumatic thing ever in a society. But once you see a meme, you're like, okay, we can, we can move on now. <laughs> It's so it's it's so funny you use the word coping because I was about to say cope mm-hmm. is such a great word <laughs> yeah, that the that... internet has come up with and because it describes such a like important and true thing mm-hmm. for which there isn't quite a word because lies <laughs> like cope is a a type of lie but 
it's more than that it's a it's a way of it's literally a way of coping right mm-hmm. that's where the word comes from and I think that particularly when it comes to things like it's really interesting the responses to my book just so far and from British readers probably the most I've had some more negative reviews I've had some positive reviews you know probably the the like single most important determining factor in terms of people's response is their age Mm. so young women and to some extent young men are more likely to be critical of it and older women are more likely in particular and older men too but particularly with women like the age thing is massive of course and I don't and I don't think it's generational I don't think it's that boomers or whatever are more well disposed towards the idea I think it's life cycle Mm -hmm. I think it's because you've lived it Mm -hmm. and maybe you've got teenage daughters you've seen your friends live it whatever you've you've lost you've let go of the cope Mm. that you needed to because it's like the sexual culture is really brutal it is brutal it's brutal and I think to get through it and to still like maintain self-esteem that having sex like a man is empowering narrative is very, very useful. It's like it's there to be picked up and you can like, you can wear it as a costume totally. and kind of hide the fact that actually you're really suffering. Mm-hmm. And it's a lie to other people and it's a lie to yourself. Mm-hmm. The problem is that it's also, in- it encourages you to like, to keep spiraling downwards. Yeah, it is it has, kind it's of a like feedback. addiction. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 and for me, the two were hand in hand, you mm. know, it was like when I got sober, the reason that I wrote, started writing this piece was because I was waitressing and I was 35, I was waiting tables and this 19 year old, young, fresh faced, fun, free spirited girl who's just kind of coming to LA and into the world was like, have you ever regret having sex with a man? And my instinctive response was all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't there there that's not entirely true but it's mostly true and mm-hmm. I I really realized and I had just recently gotten sober at this point and so you, part of getting sober is kind of looking you do a sex inventory and the 12 steps and you have to mm-hmm. go through and look at all the ways you're dysfunctional if you do it thoroughly in your sexual life, whether it's sleeping with a married man or, you know, hooking it, all the things that you can do. And I was really in that moment looking at how many of the men I had slept with that I really didn't want to sleep with. And Mm. when you talk about consent, there were a lot of times when it was just easier to sleep with them. You know, there's there you're drunk. You don't you don't feel like you've you feel like you've kind of led them on. You don't want to deal with like the repercussions of saying no. If you don't know them that well, you're not sure what that looks Mm -hmm. like. Uh, All the things Mm -hmm. you address in your book. So consent is a very, as you mentioned, low bar. It's Mm. it's not necessarily in every single circumstance there are so many factors that could play into that consent that um, might might not make it as consensual as it seems. I mean, just even society mm. and being so pro-sex plays into this idea of yeah consent. Yeah, yeah, completely. Because we're social animals and we do what's normal and we respond to incentives, mm-hmm. you know. And the fact is that, like, if you're if you're a young woman and you're looking to find a boyfriend and you're not willing to have sex on the first date, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. You know, you have to be like extra attractive to offset we that. We sound like a bunch of conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're like a bunch of trad wives over here, <laughs> which is funny. I was talking to Constantine Kissin and Francis. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, they were just yep. came through LA and we were having a pre podcast in real life conversation. And I was talking about when I was first coming up through when I blasted into like the culture wars. Then I started pushing back against some of this stuff on the left and I started doing a lot of right wing, just talking to people on the right wing because they were the only people who would have me on. And there was this whole mentality and ethos of like, oh, if a woman doesn't have a baby, she's basically useless and her ovaries are dried and she goes crazy. Mm -hmm. And and the empty egg carton. mm, I always called it wasted. I called it wasted womb shaming. I was like, there's a Mm. lot of (laughs) wasted womb shaming going on, 
which mm-hmm. I don't think is fair to women at mm. all. But mm. on the other hand, I was like, you know, joking with Francis and Constantine. I'm like, but those conservatives did have a point. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not sure how to balance the 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 tension I have between stop wasted womb shaming these women because there's some there's some misogyny there too. I see yeah, this too absolutely. around like the trans stuff on the right where yeah. they'll be like, oh, define women. You know, here's the definition of a woman. And I'm like, you guys don't really care about women's rights. Like your T-shirt mm. that says women is a with the definition should be also include and makes me a sandwich in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, it's it's mm. not I, I don't always trust that it's coming from the best place. How are you? How are you balancing? I mean, and I've seen right you. Thing. Yeah, how are you balancing this? Because I've seen you getting some traction on the on the right wing. <laughs> yeah, I think that increasingly, femi- particularly in the UK, and I hope this happens in the states. I think that feminism increasingly is leaving the left, mm. but not necessarily joining the right, or maybe in a very because you're completely right there is so much there's so much misogyny on the right there's Mm -hmm. so much misogyny on the left like Mm -hmm. there just isn't and there always has been yeah like back in the 60s and 70s you had second wave feminists who would be like horribly abused by men on the left who are supposed to be their allies Mm -hmm. so this is this is not you know a new thing to feel betrayed by male political allies (laughs) and i think that so I think the thing is, I don't really believe in patriarchy. I don't think that patriarchy is a very useful, t- well, no, clearly patriarchy has like a real meaning in anthropology, meaning right. like, you know, societies where men hold positions of power and stuff. And, and clearly we were formerly a patriarchy up until really recently. The the type of use of the word that I don't, I avoid using is when it's like patriarchy is dark matter, like this idea that patriarchy infuses everything and women are just like second class in every possible way. I think it's more complicated than that. I don't think that women are second class in every possible way. No. I think, I think actually the stuff that sucks for women most comes from biology. I think mother nature is the biggest misogynist out there. Yes. <laughs> there are just unfairnesses that you kind of can't get past, but, and also clearly plenty of individual misogynists i think the main thing that the main way in which women disadvantaged in public life is that the nature of having kids is that we kind of can't participate as men can we just can't Mm -hmm. if you're going to have more less so now i mean this is one of the good things about the pill because we can have fewer children we can have children when we choose to it's much easier now to participate in public life Mm -hmm. But it's not a coincidence that senior politicians, over, female senior politicians, overwhelmingly are childless, mm. and and CEOs, and like all the women at the top of everything, basically, are much much less likely to have children than the average woman. And I think they're a lot that, of work. <laughs> they, yeah, they they're just, a lot you know, of freaking work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's this line I can't remember who said it that um, socialism takes up too many evenings. <laughs> like the idea that you just have to show up to do all this stuff, and if you're busy. <laughs> you know yeah like my son's dinner time is at six yeah like sorry I know. <laughs> that means that I'm I'm not available that's just the nature of it and the more kids you have the more, the more of your life that's truthful and so I think that 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 factor the fact that we are always kind of busy has meant that women's interests have just never been represented as as well as men's mm-hmm. and I th- particularly mother's interests and I think that that is like f- to my mind that's the feminist project right to say like women have some specific interests that are different from men's interests. And even if, you know, I don't think that men are all evil by any means, like even if there are good men who really want to stand up for women, there's like, there's a, there's a, there's a certain extent to which they just can't really get it. They don't really understand. There's always going to be a bit of a, like a mental gap. Mm-hmm. And I think that the effort to try and like things like maternity leave. Yep. Things like, you know, like the very many like serious wins for women, things like women's health concerns being Mm -hmm. taken more seriously than they often are. Like the fact that we don't know anything about endometriosis and Viagra is like funded through. Do you know what I mean? Like that that sort of thing. The COVID thing was a perfect example of this for me. Modern example where I I got the shot and didn't get my period for three months and everybody Mm. dismissed me and said, Mm. oh, that's just your age that maybe it was. They're like, that's just. And I'm like, no, I'm when I went into my OBGYN and said this, they said, oh, everyone's periods are messed up from the shot. And I was like, everyone like 
How mm. how are we not having a conversation with the nurse just kind of, you know, dismissively said this. And when I went online and said this, people told me I was a crazy conspiracy theorist. And then it comes out they didn't even study how COVID itself affected women's menstrual mm. cycles, let alone the shot. So they had no idea how the shot was going to affect a woman's menstrual cycle because they didn't even think to study how COVID did, which is to me a modern classic example of how this still we're not taking this stuff into consideration. It's 2020. And you would yeah. think people would be like, hey, how does this virus that's going around the world affect women's reproductive organs and Literally cycles and the they population. didn't at all yeah it's crazy yeah, yeah 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 and I think that a lot of this comes down to the fact that like you do disproportionately have men in positions of influence mm. and that does come back to biology largely but it's also it's something that we can ameliorate politically mm -hmm. which is I think what like what feminism is basically like the, that's what feminism should be about obviously the term is used very in all sorts of different ways but to my mind that's that's what's good about it we do have different men and women are different we have different interests mm -hmm. which are sometimes aligned and sometimes not and that's kind of what what equality looks like for you I guess I mean whether you want to call it equality I mean the nature of it is just that we're not we're morally equal but we're not other, we're not the same right yeah it's it's something that was really I had the women from women's liberation front uh wolf on oh, yeah. Yep. Radical feminists and hilarious, yeah. by the way. Can't believe we didn't get canceled for that podcast, but we just kind of fly under the radar here. And they made a really great point that sat with me, and, and you allude to this in your book as well, about they said, particularly about like the sex work is work. They're mm -hmm. like, we look at what our allies are doing and not what they're saying. And they're not telling their daughters to go be prostitutes. No. That was just such a, and it is kind of like you mentioned, I love that you alluded to I, Rob Henderson, the luxury beliefs, because yeah. that to me is such a luxury belief. It's it's another yeah. one of those mantras that you can just parrot and it doesn't, you don't actually have to look at the consequences of what the, the world that you're creating with that, because it's probably going to fall on the lower classes generally. Yeah. Yeah. I think the group that have done worst out of the sexual revolution are poor women, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly. Yeah. 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 Because things like the sex industry, I mean, you get, you get, you know, PhD students or whatever, like moonlighting as OnlyFans creators. Mm -hmm. But like, let's be real, the women who are selling blowjobs for truckers are not from that class. Right. Of course they're not. Yeah, no one wants that, and no one wants that for their daughters. And yet you end up like, it's, it, it, uh, like the hypocrisy uh, just drives me absolutely insane. I was confronted with this when I went on a very conservative show with these young people, and the guy is like, I think he's like borderline <laughs> men's right. I mean, he's he mm. seems like adjacent to this crowd, but he was kind of pushing me about because I was like <laughs> way pre OnlyFans posting nudies, but it was more free and it was just as a reaction to that double standard which is something mm -hmm. why I've been having a hard time writing this piece because I don't know how to write it without throwing the baby out with the bathwater and yeah. so he pushed me about the like oh you're pregnant I was pregnant when I was on the show and he's like how are you gonna reconcile that you posted these nudies and have this conversation with your daughter and I said, you know, I think, A, it's a good starting point when she's old enough to have a conversation that no one ever had with me and that mm -hmm. I would want to have. It, for me, sex was still, you know, the old school idea about sex is something you need to hold on to is still in a way commodifying sex. It was like my upbringing was very much like, don't lose that thing or you won't be valuable to a man. Mm. And that to me was an early, it still put sex in a, a place of, of it's a commodity. And mm. then it was, so it was easy for me to kind of shift into, it felt like I was liberating myself from that double standard that I saw. Men got to just enjoy sex without having to feel like they were less valuable if they went out and had sex. And yep. We had this conversation, but then again, jokingly, but 
not jokingly, I was like, and also I hope I raise her so she doesn't feel the need to do that. Mm. <laughs> like put pictures of herself naked out there. And I don't regret my nudie shots at all. But it is it is a weird thing to balance in in the context of like, oh, I now suddenly have a daughter and mm. this all looks differently from that perspective. And how am I going to have a conversation with her about this? And mm. what did it mean for me? And it was it was just one of those moments where I was like, oh, in that in that joke, in that throwaway joke, there's some kernel of truth <laughs> because a lot of it was probably trauma you know, from, from this reaction. So that's where I think your chapters particular, we pretty much talked loveless sex is not empowering. We've covered consent is not enough. <laughs> you know, people are not products and violence is not love or violence is not yeah. love and people are not products. Can you talk about violence is not love? So that's just about BDSM mm -hmm. and porn kind of. So I work on a campaign called We Can't Consent to This which is about this increasingly common phenomenon where men, it's always men, will kill women and say that they consented to it or that they consented to violence as part of sex and that they accidentally died as a consequence. And Fiona McKenzie, my friend who founded who founded the campaign, she noticed that it was, this was like cropping up in news stories and stuff. It happens all over, all over the world. Wow. And that they were getting away with it by basically saying that this woman was I mean basically saying this woman was a slut yeah. yeah and that that she was up for this and that she like sought out potentially lethal violence like grotesque violence often right like a lot a lot of these cases have involved strangulation but you've also got like horrific internal injuries you know like as bad as you can imagine mm -hmm. some of these cases and it's and it's very often evidence that there's been long-standing domestic abuse sometimes these women have been in prostitution picked mm -hmm. up by punters who then claim that they you know just were really up for this incredibly dangerous thing that resulted in their in their death, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet men were getting away with it. They're getting they're getting manslaughter convictions instead of murder convictions. They're getting really short sentences, sometimes like three years, four years kind of thing, for taking a woman's life. And obviously she's not there, she's not there to give her side of it. Mm -hmm. And actually it's re-traumatizing for her family to have this this story spun about their loved one in mm -hmm. court and in, in the in the newspapers and everything. And I think that I think what the when we and we have successfully managed to change the law in the UK to make it more difficult for defendants to use this to use this defense. But it's a difficult one because they can spin any story they like, right. really. And can I ask I you think a question? Are these generally yeah. white men who are getting away with this? I don't know the race of all of the mm. defendants. The victims are overwhelmingly white, but then the UK is very white. Yeah. Yeah. I would be curious to know. Our big, our biggest ethnic minority is South Asian, mm. and there are no South Asian victims and defendants okay. in our list at all, which is is probably telling. I think that's because these defendants don't think anyone would believe it about a woman who wore hijab. Right. Right. I think that they wouldn't think it was plausible. Right. Which is possibly why they're not attempting this, because like if you know if you are a man who has say strangled his wife to death, you don't really have many like options for defending yourself mm -hmm. this is one of them you can mm -hmm. say that she asked me to right and what you're basically relying on is is whether or not people will think that's plausible that's crazy and what seems to be happening is that people are more and more willing to think that's plausible right in the newspapers you know these terrible headlines like you know sex crazy mum killed in sex game gone wrong sort so of like bananas yeah because because it seems as though people this is like an effect of porn this is an effect of the sexual revolution running like running its course this really like the increasingly aggressive nature of sexual norms the idea that being being choked, spat on, slapped, having your hair pulled, being called a whore, whatever, that this is normal. Mm -hmm. When did that become normal? Right. I mean, apparently, maybe turn of the century, it definitely seems to be linked to porn. Mm. And you can see it in surveys of young women and comparing it with older cohorts. Young women are much more likely to report this kind of stuff. 
and not necessarily consensually. I mean, mm-hmm. so, as we know, that's that's slippery, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's consensual, sometimes it's not, but also this is within a context where it's increasingly normalized. Mm-hmm. And if you're like a 14 year old girl who's going on Instagram and seeing images of choking on a platform that's supposed to be suitable for girls your age, it's like this stuff is not just on porn sites, it's everywhere. Wow. I didn't know it was like, on Instagram. Yeah. If that's what you're being raised on, and also, moreover, if this is being presented as like a status thing, if you being super sexy, super up for it, super adventurous is a way of you kind of getting positive attention from men, feeling cool, mm-hmm. of course you're going to, you know. And so that's why we get phenomenon like teenage girls showing like photos of their neck bruises on TikTok, which is a sort of disturbing trend that you've got because to their mind, what they're doing is they're showing how like liberated they are. Right. But like the problem is that from the outside, that girl could maybe she's genuine. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm skeptical, but maybe she's this, she's come up with this herself. She genuinely is really enjoying it. She's genuinely consenting. Maybe she's a domestic violence victim. From the outside, it looks exactly the same. Yeah. And in co- and in a courtroom, it looks exactly the same. And if you don't have, if if the victim's not there, if she's dead. How on earth are you supposed to tell the difference? And I think that that's really telling. Like, if you can't tell the difference between BDSM, that's supposedly just like kinky and exciting and adventurous, and like sexual crime, does that not tell you something about BDSM as a cultural norm? Yeah, the, it's weird because the BDSM culture is so the true BDSM culture, like the people mm. who are into it not I wouldn't call this like mainstreaming up that's the weird thing you know I think you mentioned in in your that what's that dumb book that I couldn't get through because it was so poorly written 50 shades of gray um so (laughs) I think that was a moment that kind of mainstreamed a culture that actually is pretty ethical and has a lot of um hard well it aspires to be it aspires yeah. to be. I think there's a dark side to it. Of course. The there people who've left side. the community will talk about. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, but I still think that there, again, it was kind of a ni- niche community that mm-hmm. was underground, you know, not, yeah. it wasn't like mainstream. And then this mainstreaming of something that generally, again, there's, like you said, this dark side, but from the people I know who partake in, this community there's rules and all kinds of there's lots of considerations and people seem to the people who are into it seem like they take that kind of the the rules around it seriously and a lot of them aren't happy that it's gone mainstream because they don't there aren't these rules and you know people aren't taking each other they're not respecting one another. There's a, allegedly a lot of respect. And so that's that's the weirdest thing to me is that it's gone mainstream. And like mm. you said, I think porn has been like one of the main lines for this. But for women, it's things like Fifty Shades of Grey that have... Cos- Cosmo. Yeah. And like yeah. Cosmo for Kids or whatever, the <laughs> Teen Vogue or whatever, teen where it's like how oh, to do butt Vogue. stuff. I, that is not yeah. the that the Teen Vogue that I grew up with. You know, it, I didn't no. grow My little Cosmo is like innocent <laughs> compared to <laughs> how to do butt stuff. And you remember that, that article in Teen Vogue, it didn't he even include the clitoris in the diagram. Yeah. <laughs> remember, it was just like. It was like a terrible parody. No, the worst possible. It was like, did a man women's write media. this? <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and then people are not products. We kind of touched on this with the the OnlyFans, and I mean, OnlyFans is everywhere. Everyone, I yeah, everyone's got an OnlyFans. It seems like <laughs> you know. It's like, I mean, I, it kind of. Like there's like an Instagram to OnlyFans pipeline, isn't there? If you're already, like, as you were saying, if you're already sharing news for free, why, why not get paid? It? Yeah. That yeah. was my was thinking. I, yeah. When I was sharing them, I, people started demanding them and I was like, F this, I'm going to make money. And I put them on Patreon. And somebody the mm-hmm. other day in one of my comments was like, because I was, I wrote about like I was telling you the newborn bubble, and just the the, the refrain in that piece was "Is she breathing?" And mm-hmm. someone was like, "We've come a long way from selling pictures of butts," and I was like, 
<laughs> it's true. You know? <laughs> if you've been following me, it's been a journey. <laughs> And I do think things like, you know, I think a lot about Kim Kardashian, who's Mm -hmm. why wouldn't women think that there's there's a also kind of a pipeline from this sex tape or OnlyFans to immense wealth and stardom. Yeah. When the most probably recognizable woman in the world in this moment, that's exactly her. Now she's, you know, a lawyer. So there's there's something. Yeah. How do you feel about the, you know, that messaging? I mean, I guess Kim Kaz. I wonder how happy Kim Kardashian is. I mean, they seem. I don't fun. know. <laughs> She's really bit- well. She has a terrible. Not that I follow very closely, despite writing for a tabloid newspaper. But that she has an unhappy relationship with K- Kanye, right? Well, I think they're broken up. Yeah. And now she was with Pete Davidson, but then that recently that ended too. But yeah. I mean, all but she's of clearly those doing pretty well, like right? They're in horrific relationships. <laughs> like I wouldn't yeah. want any of their relationships. Yeah. But she seems. But it's hard to tell when you're that me- mediated of a human. How do you? How do you even? Does she even really know what's real? You know, when you're when you've been on a reality television show for well over a decade, and you're yeah. just constantly on and always. F- posting when you're curating that image constantly do you do you Mm. have moments of deep reflection and quiet where that lonely you know she's got a lot of kids and i I was thinking the other sorry go on go on i was thinking the other day that for most of human history you wouldn't um people wouldn't see themselves in mirrors yeah you might see yourself in reflective surfaces sometimes i guess but you wouldn't you didn't have mirrors really and you certainly didn't have cameras and how strange it must be for, for someone like Kim Kardashian. I mean, I still find it a bit strange to watch myself on telly. And I'm like, just compare with Kim Kardashian. She's, she she lives her whole life as a spectator on it, in it you know, in that she's, she's a product, constantly though. looking at herself. as Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I guess she's she kind of got famous from a sex tape. So she from definitely her... got famous from a sex tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, having also, she was already on reality TV, right? She, her mother up with basically, the Kardashians was no, pre- that, no, I was think it that was post. Her oh mother, goodness. like, is a pimped her, g- yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. of them, the whole yeah. that's kind of the internet joke about her is that she's yeah. like, you know, she created this empire, she took that kind of moment and and turned it into billions of dollars. And yeah. I've been thinking a lot. Your book made me think a lot about Kim Kardashian because mm. she's someone who seems to have had enough escape velocity or something to transcend a lot of the pitfalls about what you're talking about. But like you said, we are not privy to what her inner landscape looks like. She does seem to be like the, the some of the women that I write about in the book, like Marilyn Monroe, Britney Spears. They're very clearly examples of women who got really, really... Yeah, they're tragic. Had a really devastating mm-hmm. experience of, of of so-called sexual liberation, right? And yeah, maybe Kim is a, an exception. I mean, she's like 35. Yeah. So I guess time maybe will tell. And they're all um, having babies. You know, that's kind yeah. of... Because I was reading this whole article that kids are the new status... Right, because they're so expensive. Mm-hmm. So the yeah, more yeah. you have Celebrities now, have loads. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then of course Kim didn't have. I think she had two, and then had surrogacy because she had some horrible. I think she had really serious medical conditions, allegedly. Allegedly, she also got really fat. Yeah, when she got. I mean, I say this as someone who also got really fat when she was pregnant, but (laughs) I'm still like uh, (laughs) when her when her whole when her whole her whole brand her whole living is based on being gorgeous. Like, that does matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my cousin and I had a conversation about this because I was like, and then she alleged, you know, and like, and then she had mm. surrogates after she realized what it does to your body. And she pushed back and said she thinks she had some, like, serious medical condition. And then I was like, okay. allegedly. Well, we don't want to libel anyone. No. <laughs> I'm like, but the, po- the point She's being, a fascinating, but she is kind of a is, fascinating... Yeah, right. She is fascinating, yeah, ...case yeah. study and 
in the yeah. context of your book and yeah, keep going maybe, out she's, products. maybe she's an exception. A, a massive ex- exception. I mean, if yeah. she is an exception, she's an exception enough that a lot of people will buy into this and think. Yes, she's she's like a terrible role model in that sense. Not, you know, not necessarily wanting to kind of throw any shade at her, but like she's so unusual. I mean, this is this is so often the case with OnlyFans too. This whole idea that you'll log onto OnlyFans and you'll suddenly be like buying your own home and all of this stuff. How many? Like the median the median OnlyFans creator has thirty subscribers. Oh, right. I mean, I um, was shocked she's... I had any because I was like, "Who's buying forty year old titties?" <laughs> like when they're free. But it that was the interesting thing is that it wasn't from my perspective as a woman. These were, and my very wise older friend was like, "There are a lot of lonely people in this world, Bridget," and that was sad mm. to me because it was in many instances just men who wanted to connect more than they wanted the boobs mm. because that doesn't make any sense. So yeah, there are only fans is like the girlfriend experience of, of porn, right? Mm, that's interesting. And it's so much sadder <laughs> for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I do feel as though that, I mean, I think that it, when it comes to the porn industry, like the, there's so many horror stories of, of women who got really chewed up by it and like there's so much child sexual abuse on there and everything. But so, so like those are the real victims, mm-hmm. but I think the users are victims too. Yeah, it messes with your head so much. Yeah, and it messes with your relationships so much. And yep. I, I get some, I get some really, really, really poignant um emails sometimes from men who have really difficult yep. relationships with porn, and who've heard me on podcasts or read me or whatever, and and are like, thank you so much for for talking about this, and they break my heart. And I really yep. like I because when I was because I was pregnant while I was writing this book. And I, I found out that I was having a little boy kind of in the middle of it. And I think I just assumed for some reason that I'd have a girl because it seemed as though it seemed so fitting in a way with like the right. whole focus of the book. And, and then, and it, I'd been thinking this already, but it encouraged me to think even more about how much I don't want this for my son. Mm. I actually don't, I don't want my son to be Hugh Hefner. Right. Right. And not just because I disapprove of Hugh Hefner, just because actually he, he, it's kind of there's a glamour potentially, you know. There's a the, the 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 people who are winning from this kind of culture are the men who can who can get laid consequence free and can feel really kind of powerful and whatever. And clearly, Hugh Hefner in his prime had a lot of fun, but it 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 wears off. It's not permanent. You can't be doing this when you're sixty. No, I, I mean this is more tr- this is more true for women. So like, I don't know what Kim Kardashian's going to do when she's fifty. Maybe she'll have accumulated she'll enough be a money lawyer. that she can just <laughs> yeah, maybe. So maybe she has like maybe she has a, a like emergency exit. She'll pivot. And... She'll pivot. Yeah, she's pivoting. Yeah. She's pivoting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Hugh Hefner lost his glamour. He lost his friends, and actually, by the end of his life, he was he was pathetic. Well, I'll tell you, I went to the last party at the mansion because I was at at Playboy. It was the Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was the saddest, most... And I had been there in my 20s. So when I lived in Mm -hmm. LA, my early 20s, I went to a party. And it was still... It was the early 2000s. It was still... There was still some shine on that. Mm -hmm. And it was just like grimy and the the whole place felt kind of run down and the mm-hmm. grotto the the vibe was just bad there was just and there were a lot of people who had been me recently kind of me tooed and mm-hmm. the women were still flocking to them showing them headshots and trying to get a role in their next movie but there was just yeah. something i kept saying to my friend i was like you know this place really peaked like in the 70s and it's yeah. kind of been downhill ever since. There may have been a, a resurgence when they were doing that whole reality show and in the late 90s, early aughts. But it's the luster had definitely worn off. And and by the time I went there for that last Midsummer Night's Dream party, it was just there. Like you said, there was something pathetic about the whole thing. Mm, mm, mm. And I think that that is in the end. Yeah, it's fun to be a playboy for a period of your life but it's not you it's not permanent Mm -hmm. and if you do that and you forego the the real meaning in life I know now I'm sounding like a conservative but it's true like most (laughs) most people get we're just like most most people get their actual sources of meaning and 
comfort and security and everything from their relationships Mm -hmm. and particularly with spouses and with children and if you and if you forego that or if you have this like weird harem like Hefner did yeah you're gonna end up in a really sad place eventually it reminds me of what you said early on in the book was uh, you were saying like every you made that analogy of everybody you become conservatives you get older basically like if you're a (laughs) conservative in your 20s and then and you said something like about your experience um working at the rape center yeah i'm trying to find the line because i under Uh, i think it is if a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged then a post-liberal feminist is a feminist who's seen the reality of male violence up close yes yeah 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 i mean there's there's some truth to the that whole thing of if you're if you as you get older you get more conservative like you said the response to it depends on what cycle of life they're in and Mm -hmm. i understand now more why my aunts on the beach when we were my sisters and i were talking about this when we were young and our aunts would be like you'll see you can't get the weight off as easily when you're in your 40s and we were like (laughs) ah you guys are just like lazy or you don't work out enough and we were like the curse is true (laughs) our aunt's curse it's absolutely like you can't reality remains undefeated you can't you can't get your way there no matter what you're going to come up against these limitations and and that's really why I think your book is so important. And in your last chapter, Marriage is Good, that's really something that I I got married and my husband is amazing. And I had been married before when I was in my 20s, but it was I always joke I got married in a blackout. It's kind of a joke. And <laughs> so this relationship was so much, it is like you said, it gives me so much meaning and purpose. And then having a baby, my gosh, it's it is... I mean, I was saying this to someone the other day. I'm like, it is like nothing else. You know, there's, and you can't really say that anymore because people will get mad and they're like, what about the people who can't have kids? And what about the Mm. trans women who want kids? And like, I'm supposed to take all these, everyone's feelings into consideration. And I have a lot of sympathy because I, like I said, got lucky, but Mm. there really is nothing else like it. It's, it's Mm. the most purpose I've ever felt in my life is just devoting myself to this being yeah you can never ever wake up and think what's the point of getting out of bed because you know what the point is (laughs) (laughs) and if I don't she's 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 letting me know. know yeah yeah exactly I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor Watkins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. I want to ask you with my two questions I ask everyone at the end of the podcast. I could talk to you forever and we're going to be, I'm going to make you be my friend now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You can't consent to this. (laughs) What is your biggest defect of character? Oh, I'm really neurotic. My husband will tell you that. I'm really neurotic. I'm really anxious. Mm. I think I've never really come across a writer who isn't. Yeah, I'm definitely. I can share <laughs> this trait with you. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're famous, famously loopy profession. Like I, I'm very like I've learned how to manage it really well, mm-hmm. and I don't have. I, I'm like very clean living and I have a very kind of stable existence, which is like in large part, due, my husband is the least neurotic person I've pretty much ever met. He's like, he's such a steady Eddie. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess des- I really need that mm-hmm. because whenever I'm getting really wound up, he's my, he's my foil. Did you find that 
whatever coping mechanisms you had put around your neuroticism where they did they leave you I felt like nothing could help me during pregnancy because mm. of the hormones I was mm. like oh yeah I've managed my hypochondria because I have hypochondria in my past mm. and a lot of neurotic behaviors that I really had started managing and I felt like I was they were mm. completely unmanageable when I was pregnant yeah, I mean, I think you just have to accept there's going to be a lot of crying. Mm. <laughs> it's just the nature of it. I was warned by a friend who I don't, I'm not, uh, I've never been hypochondriac, but the thing I get anxious about is like very unlikely accidents happening. I'm very, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> like what it. if masonry just like falls off the building or, <laughs> you know, things like that. Chronic fear of driving mm. on motorways, things like that. And I had a friend warn me before the baby was born. She was like, you're, you're going to experience levels of anxiety that in any other circumstance would be diagnosed as OCD. But in this situation, it's normal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually kind of helpful because you just think, it's my brain. Yeah. The driving thing for me um, has been real. I'm terrified yeah. to drive with her. Yeah. And yeah. Not even I because find, of oh, me. It's just time. like everyone yeah. else on the Completely. road. Completely. Yeah. Completely. It's, it's, I mean, as far as I know, this is just kind of motherhood forever. <laughs> it wears off to some extent, but that thing of constantly worrying about your children is yeah. just the burden yeah, of that's, loving them so much. I wrote a piece about that and how I was, by the end of the piece, I was like, oh, this is motherhood. It never goes away. Like, the, is she okay? Because of the whole time yeah. I was in utero, I was like, is she okay when she's quiet and not kicking? And then and is yeah. she breathing? And it's like, it, it never ends never yeah so yeah that yeah. is like you said and what's your biggest asset um other than yeah, being my a fearless writer <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say my brain and the thing i find really strange about being able to write is i i never i never really aspired to do it or or never like publicly i i always had this private wish that maybe one day I would write a book but I never set out to do it as a profession because it just seemed like a stupid thing to respond to it's not like a real job no it's a crazy bizarre job that you just end up in with luck and I I have this fear going back to my neuroticism which I know I, I share with other writers that maybe I might just wake up tomorrow and lose it yeah do you have, have that, that fear oh god yeah I mean I, I didn't because go to I don't college. quite know where it <laughs> I so I feel like a total imposter yeah <laughs> like my ability to just sit down and write something I've been commissioned to write mm -hmm. it's I don't I don't exactly know how I do it mm -hmm. and maybe I might not be able to well you're a great Next writer week, tomorrow I don't know thank you and for now <laughs> and you didn't lose your voice in this book like this book could have been kind of there's still some I don't know cheekiness not cheekiness but there's still a little bit of there's some spice in here you know there's I hear your you weren't afraid to to lean into that the attitude or the the you obviously have strong feelings about this and you didn't mm. really try to smooth that out to make the book more palatable and I appreciate that cuz there were moments especially for somebody like me who is the case study of your book and I needed those like moments of laughter or the moments of kind of like ah, okay she can she there's a moment of lightness or or a a tongue in cheek moment that is necessary, particularly for someone like me who's reading the book. There's a joke about rimming in chapter one, which I, yeah, often draws comment. <laughs> <laughs> Your readers can, <laughs> can wait and see. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you writing this. It's going to, I'm excited to see what happens when it comes to the United States. And are you coming over? Maybe, yeah. I mean, I'm waiting to see what I get. You like, go on Rogan. I'd love to go on Rogan. You'd I'll, be I, I'll be, I'll be on the next flight. If <laughs> like me. You'd be great. You'd have a great conversation with them. Yeah, yeah. I heard you on Barry's podcast with Jill. Yeah. My yeah. one final question. I know you have to go, but I'm really curious. Is did Jill make? I haven't listened to to it yet, but I did. She make any? Any arguments or kind of rebuttals or anything that made you stop and think or pause? I mean, one of the things that kind of came between us is obviously I'm from the UK and she's American and the context is a bit different. Mm. And I guess her her take, which I, I, I do partially accept, is that this culture I'm describing is not everyone's experience and there are still 
religious conservatives in America and elsewhere who are not at all accepting of hookup culture or any of this stuff. Like what I'm describing is like a particular subculture. I think that though that where we disagree is like the size of it. So she would she said that she felt as though this this ideology was only really embedded within like a handful of progressive institutions. What? She's and I don't think that's person. true. This I is think mainstream. it is much, much more exactly. I think it's much more mainstream than that. But I do take on board the fact that it's not it's also not universal. Right. But the as you said, the Christians and the people who are perhaps living more chast lives and and promoting kind of older school values do not feel represented by the culture. No, they don't. Yeah, they they're feel not, really they threatened feel, by. Yeah, they yeah, feel by mainstream like culture. they're out on the out completely. So that yeah. argument, even if they exist in America, they're not the mainstream culture at all. It's not represented in media. It's not represented in academia. It's not represented in Hollywood. Like where, mm. where is yeah, this just culture? Turn on a TV? <laughs> it's a. Yeah. It's usually a joke. It's the butt of a joke, essentially. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know that, that that argument kind of stand. I mean, I understand that they exist, but this is much more. Go on Instagram for five minutes, like you said. Mm. It's mm. all just like butts and bathing suits and, you know, influencers with their neutral tones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, My you- Instagram is just nonstop, like interiors and cooking oh i'm gonna follow you i design because i just well i don't and i don't post anything I, oh. just, I i have like my i only follow instagram accounts i basically just use it as an advertising platform they're constantly selling me things that's what i do i don't yeah, i post really i post it. my i use it to i don't it's not my main platform twitter is but i post i advertise my stuff on there all my content but i mm. i got really into it i used to hate it until i got pregnant and then it became like oh yeah they were my yeah, happy they, place they worked out you have a baby i think like, instagram are constantly sending me baby stuff and i'm like yeah yeah <laughs> what a great product the algorithm Click. knows me better than i know myself it really does yeah, yeah. i actually kind of accept it i know <laughs> i'm fine with it where can we find you online so I, I'm on Twitter at Louise underscore M underscore Perry, I think. I write for the New Statesman uh, in the UK. I also write for the Daily Mail. Yeah. And then and so the book is The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. It's out uh, 6th of September. Perfect. All in right. America. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Thank you. All month long, the biggest movies are streaming free on Pluto TV's Popcorn Summer Movies. Watch star-studded blockbusters like Titanic and Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Or fall in love with charming rom-coms like Hitch and How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. The best part? Pluto TV is 100% free. No credit cards, not even a sign-up. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. There's no check-in this week because we're on vacation. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)